Hey, this is Betsy. And this is Gina. And this is the Lost and Found podcast. Our podcast is really a labor of love. And it came about a couple years ago when we recognized that we have some incredibly interesting, passionate entrepreneurs. We're making this for you guys. If you're listening, we've made this for you because it's built, it's created for our alumni community. These are small business owners and entrepreneurs. We're in the trenches together, but the stories um, that we can share, I think will help you feel less alone, get you inspired, maybe even uh, inspire you to connect with these people. Real stories from real entrepreneurs in small communities. Welcome back to the Lost and Found podcast. Today we have a very special guest, Nicholas Klein. Nick is going in to be a third generation part of, or part of a business, of a third generation business. I think when you went through business reinvention, you kind of said, I'm maybe an owner in training. Yeah, right that now. was that's what I like to describe myself as. Uh, thanks for having me, first of all, Gina. It's great to be here. I'm really looking oh, forward wow. to this. Um, but I've always described myself as an owner in training when people ask what my job title is because there's just so much to do in small businesses as you learn how to take care of all the details, the big things, the little things. Um, there's never a job title that fits everything. No, and like this, you're talking to the audience that gets that. Yeah. That's what this podcast is all about. It's small business owners who are, they all know there's so many hats that you got to put on in a day to make it all work. Yep. So this is the perfect place for you to be right now. Well, I'm looking Thanks forward for to it. Us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Well, so we're here. Now we got to tell people, what are you training to own? Sure. What are we looking at? So my family owns Walnut Grove Mercantile in Marshall, Minnesota. And we have been, a, as you said, a third generation family business. My grandpa started the business in 1951. Grandpa Raymond. Grandpa Raymond mm-hmm. as a honey farm. So he was a beekeeper. Uh, and then my dad began to work with him in the 80s. Uh, Steve. As a, Steve as a beekeeper as well. Thank you. Uh, and then my parents added a couple different um, kind of divisions to the business. And in 2001, they added Walnut Grove Mercantile, which is a retail store and a line of products that include uh, homemade fudge, homemade caramels, um, even some homemade soap and things like that to kind of give a nostalgic um mercantile feel to a store. All right, so I'm gonna go back to clarify. So when your dad got into the beekeeping business, so it was beekeeping and making honey products. Yes. It was like, I've been in your location and I've had the sneak peek into the back office and there's a lot of awards back there. There are, so <laughs> both my my grandpa and my dad have won national championship awards. National. For, national for uh, whipped honey and clover honey. And that was largely throughout the late 70s into the early 90s is when a lot of those awards uh, were won. So they were beekeeping and making the honey products. So they had all the machinery, the equipment. They had a location. Yep. They're selling honey. Yep. They were selling it uh, locally and then to grocery stores kind of in a regional area, a pretty small regional area. Um, but a lot of people would recognize Klein Honey, especially if you're familiar with southwest Minnesota. Um, and so that was really the start of the, the family business. And then, so then your dad and your mom, Kay, yep. they decided to build the new building. They did. So they, in the early 90s, they added some kind of gourmet honeys, which is basically a whipped honey or a spun honey, and then add different flavorings to make it a little bit more of a unique product. Uh, and then in the late 90s, early 2000s, the city of Marshall was going to build what is now the YMCA, where we had our business. And so they were asking us to to move and to build a new place. And at that time, my parents decided to go for it and add a a retail store and kind of some other arms to the business uh, to really expand the offerings that we have. And it's a beautiful location. Anybody that's driven through, what's the main highway that goes right by? Highway 23. I'm sure if you've driven on that through Marshall, you've probably noticed it and thought, what is that place? Yeah, exactly. Because it kind of has like an older... Kind of vintage, like you said, it's Walnut Grove Mercantile. Yep, it's got a porch front with some cedar siding. And then on the side, you know, you'll see a sign that says fresh fudge and gifts. And I know a lot of people, we still get today, even after 20 some years of, I've driven by this building a thousand times and today was the day I decided to stop. And they went, oh my gosh, it's so cute. Yeah. 
Because, well, okay, so when they opened up this new location right off the highway, like you said, they added to it. So they have the retail store. So mm-hmm. anybody can just walk in, shop your retail store, the specialty gifts, home items, gourmet foods. It has your guys' the Klein family brand yep. food available in there as well. Yep. And then you go through the beautiful office into this huge Right, Area. we have a, a warehouse and manufacturing space kind of on the, the back side of the building, and we still make all of our products uh, on site. So we still do our honeys, and we do soaps and barbecue sauce and fudge and caramels, and we're always looking to add new products as well. It's just a matter of how much time we have to dedicate to, you know, kind of some food experimentation. Um, but there's a lot to the building that, that we've built, and we're at a point now that we need to put an expansion on because we're running out of room. What? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So you mentioned this, the fudge. Mm-hmm. So now we're into we're into fudge. Where did the fudge get into? into so the when business? when my parents built the building, they were talking with some other retail store owners that they knew throughout the state, and one of them had suggested that they bring fudge into their offerings, and so they knew nothing about it, and they thought, well, you know, we're already spending all this money. Why not add a few more thousand to get some fudge <laughs> kettles and things like that in? And so they started to work with a company called Calico, which is a company that provides most of the fudge across the country. They're sort of pre-mixes and things like that. And when we first started, we made our fudge that way. And then after a few years, my dad said, I can do this better and I can do it more affordable. We're going to figure out our own recipe. Because that's the type of person your dad is. It is. He's always trying to find ways to do things a little bit better, a little more efficiently. Um, and he likes to create things. And yeah, it's awesome. Yep. He's pushing to the next, kind of the next thing, the next step. He keeps everybody moving forward. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so he was able, it took a while, you know, probably took us a year, year and a half to just experiment over time and see how products held up, see how they tasted, see how they, uh, the textures were. Um, but eventually we, we came upon a recipe, or I shouldn't say, we created a recipe yeah. that worked, uh, we thought, pretty perfectly. And so we just started to slowly grow that um, by buying ingredients in more bulk quantities uh, to where we are now, where we're producing, you know, probably close to 100,000 pounds of fudge a year, uh, which is a far cry from where we were 15 or 20 years ago when we started. 100,000 pounds of fudge a year. Yeah. And this fudge in a variety of flavors. Yep. Is sold in the retail store. Yep. But it's also. We also fundraise with it. So I'm assuming for many of our listeners here, they probably have come across it in some form or another. We work with a lot of schools or church groups or sports teams, civic organizations, really any any group that would fundraise. Um, We work with them to offer our fudge and our caramels and they are able to receive 50% of the total sales, which is pretty unheard of for most fundraising um, products, whether it's, you know, um, pastries or frozen pizzas or Mm -hmm. wrapping paper. Usually the percentage that goes to the group is probably 30% or less, 20% or less. Um, But it's really important to us to be able to offer a higher percentage so these groups can actually afford to do the trips that they want to do, get the equipment that they need, things like that to make sure it's worthwhile for them. Now, when you went through our startup boot camp, which was fall of 2022, September 22, yep. and then we had the opportunity to come on back for business reinvention, our 10-week program, and that was the fall of 2023. Yep. Now, what I heard, so just to lay it all out there, so, so I mean, our everybody knows, so Walnut Grove Mercantile and Klein Family Foods. So there's the retail space, which yep. is adorable, you sell fudge, you sell the Klein family food brands, which is the the honeys, the barbecues, the soaps, the product that you make. You sell the fudge that you make. You also have gift in home decor, kids, it's adorable. And then you have, so the Klein family foods where you're making those, and then it's the fudge and the fundraising part of the business. Yep. So we kind of have three different. Yeah, there's a few different kind of arms to the business. There's the retail store, like you said, mm-hmm. where we sell all of our products plus other great gifts and kids items and other food products from other companies that we think are really good. Yeah. Um, quality is always our most important thing in the products that we carry in the store. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if we make it or not. If it's a good product, we want to make sure we carry it and offer it to our customers. Um, the second part is kind of the wholesale business. We do a little bit of wholesaling with some of our honey. Not a whole lot, but a little bit. 
But the main part of our business now has become this fundraising arm, which is selling our fudge and our caramels to groups all across the country um, during fundraising. And a lot of time it's in the fourth quarter of the year. Right. It's, it's pretty much always through the school year. So maybe August or September through May is when our groups are scheduled to sell. And a lot of them are right around that Thanksgiving, Christmas time where most families want to um, – sell fudge it's probably the easiest time to sell fudge during thanksgiving and christmas right and it's so and it's the fundraising because when you went through our programs i would say during reinvention there was a lot of focus on the fundraising yes. kind of maybe well, maybe it was the time of year because that was a really busy time of year but also it kind of seemed that's where your fa- your passions mm-hmm. were maybe I, focused at that time i think both passions and i think we recognize that that is probably the most opportune area for growth Mm -hmm. that would probably be the easiest area for us to grow substantially and so it makes the most sense to put more energy and more time and more thought into that part of the business well now i have this great idea that this whole podcast is going to tie into this fundraising and everything else well it's perfect if anybody out there's listening (laughs) then uh if you need some fundraiser you know just reach on out to us you can find us online over in marshall and we'd love to work with you well and because okay you have a beautiful why and we also worked on a why for the business. So you have a personal why and a business why, and it seemed to me that they just fit in, fit together so very well. Right. And also with this whole fundraising business. So why don't you tell us what your why is? Sure. So my why is believing in generosity and equal opportunity. Um, and I have a very specific childhood memory that kind of leads me into that. When I was a kid, I was probably in third or fourth grade, and it was about the age where you go from kind of some city league baseball where you just play over the summer and it probably costs 20 bucks or something. Sure, like and you go in community ed yeah. and things like that to what was be- at the time a little bit of a newer thing, but what is now just everywhere, which is traveling sports. And so it was um, pretty expensive. Mm-hmm. And at the time, even though I didn't specifically ask my parents, I think I was aware that there wasn't a lot of extra money to be able to afford to participate in that. And so I didn't. And so... I love baseball. It's my favorite sport. And that was really about the last time I ever played organized baseball was in second or third grade because then I didn't get onto the traveling team cycle. And then in high school, uh, I didn't go out for baseball, actually, because my my class actually has a lot of very competitive boys. We had a very boy heavy class. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was sort of it was hard. It hasn't you know, had a huge impact on my life, but it was hard to not be able to play baseball um, because of financial circumstances. And so it's important to me as we do these fundraisers and work with these groups to know that we're giving them as much as we can from the portion of the sales so that the kids that are needing a new instrument or wanting to go to a regional competition, a marching band, or need to participate in a sports team and need some help with travel expenses can afford to do that. Um, And so that's part of the reason we do the 50%. I don't ever want to change that 50%. You know, if I have to make changes in other areas to make the money come out, that's fine. But that's just really important to me to make sure that the purpose of what we're doing, in my mind, is not to make money. It's to make sure that kids and individuals have access to the things that they want to do in life. I think that's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. I do too. That's pretty great. <laughs> well, and see, even I can see this like light sparking in you even right now when we're talking about it. And yeah. think, I mean, how many organizations do you work with in a school year? Can you even put a number oh, to it? Oh, it's probably 150 or so. Organizations. Organizations, yeah. With multiple and all, kids. And all over the country. A lot of them are kind of focused in the upper Midwest. That's where a lot of our fundraisers are. Mm-hmm. But we have fundraisers in California and Georgia and several in New York and Pennsylvania. And so people find us, you know, and we always ask them, how did you find out about us? Because you'll get a, you know, a contact form from someone out in Georgia and you think, boy, how did they come across us? And they all have different stories, whether they have a family member who did one in a different state or they were looking for a good fundraiser and they came across ours online. Um, but there's always people out there who are looking for, for some help fundraising. So when you went through the boot camp program and yeah. you and your dad went through together and we were working on like the business why, and I remember you guys saying, well, I, I think it settled in on making a delicious difference. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you're doing. 
That is, and full credit to both you and Betsy for that, because I know you were helpful in coming up with that sort of slogan for us, but it really hit home for both of us that we are making a delicious difference because first and foremost, we want to be able to help these communities and these individuals who need help. But secondly, we want to make sure that we're making a product that it's actually worthwhile. Nobody wants to uh, go out to a fundraising group and say, we want you to sell this and we know it's an inferior chocolate. Why would we want to do that? That mm -hmm. reflects badly on us. It reflects badly mm -hmm. on the group. They're not going to be able to sell as much. Um, so those are the two things making a delicious difference, which is great because we are making it delicious. We want to make sure we're always using the highest quality and the best recipe we can. And we're making a great difference in the lives of everyone who works with us because we do give back so much to these communities. Yeah, well, and you, you can't... It's, we didn't craft that. You guys said it all. We just put the words together. Well, because as a family business and meeting you and what you do, like you are very passionate, but you can tell you're hardworking. It's high quality. Your hearts are in it. Like this is, it's your thing. We just kind of crafted the word in the order that it well, needed to be. Well, thank you for your craft. You did it yes. all. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's what we do. We're just, we're mm -hmm. all here listening. Yeah. And then we help put it together. Yep. Um, so when I hear you're making a del delicious difference, your personal why, generosity, and equal opportunities, and you kind of said through the fundraising and the fudge, like how you're putting that to work, but how are you, how are you putting that to work in, like in your life, just in your life? Well, I, I tend to be a very generous and hardworking person in mm -hmm. my personal life as well. And so I spend a lot of time helping out my family, my in-laws. Um, I have a beautiful wife, Celia, who we've been married for about two and a half years now. And so I like to spend a lot of time making sure that I'm taking care of her, mm -hmm. uh, taking care of our home. And then as my parents who are sort of getting to the end of their careers, my dad is now 70 and my mom is uh, 67, you know, just making sure that I can help with anything that they might need either within the, uh, the office and the business or outside of it if they just need help around the house. My in-laws are about 25 miles away. Um, and sometimes they need some help out at the farm. So there's a lot of people that I enjoy being able to spend time giving back to. And I, I truly believe that the Lord has blessed me with a lot of abilities and a lot of talent. And it's my responsibility to, to use those and to give those back. I respect that a lot. That's beautiful. Thanks. Yeah, good for you for recognizing it and putting it to work too. Yeah. It's pretty Thank awesome. You. Yeah, well, thank you. So, I work very hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so tired. No, I don't know if I'm so tired, but I'm very busy. So, I work very hard and, you know, I just like to spend time. I'm, I'm a people person. I like to spend time in my relationships and put energy into that to, to really build me up. So. Well, so we haven't really talked about, so this is where you are now, but we didn't really talk about how you got to where you are now because when you... High school, after high school, you went away to school. Yep. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the journey that brought you back sure. to Marshall? Sure. So I, uh, after high school, I went to college at Aquinas College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, at the time, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I really liked history uh, and I liked business. So I actually have a history major with a business minor. Oh, nice. And then when I was getting ready to graduate, I have always had this inkling to come back and work in the business, the family business, mm -hmm. because I like it so much. But... It just didn't quite feel like the right time. And so I was able to have an internship in my senior year at college um, at the Gerald Ford Presidential Museum in Grand Rapids. Wow. And that was, I had a really great mentor there. It was really eye opening to me. And I thought, you know what? I might want to pursue basically museum studies. Uh, and so I applied for graduate school at Eastern Illinois for their historical administration program. And I ended up getting accepted to that. That historical was historical administration, administration program. Program. Okay, so now we have we have history, we have business, and historical administration. Administration. Yes. Okay, keep going. And so <laughs> we, uh, it's a very intense program. It was one year of graduate school. Normally, it's a two year to get a master's okay. degree. So it was one year, and then they require six months of either on the job experience or an internship before you can come back and take your final exams, and then you're graduated. So that was a very intense year for me. Uh, I was able to get an internship at Vesterheim Norwegian American Museum in Decorah, Iowa, if anyone is familiar with that. Uh, and from there, I was hired actually to be the membership manager at the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science in Albuquerque. Cool. So I decided, you know, I don't know anything about New Mexico. 
I don't know anyone in New Mexico, but why not? You know, you're young, why not go there? Uh, so I took the job and I was there for just about two years. Really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the area that I was living and just the new culture, different climate, different food. Um, but I felt a calling to come back to the Midwest. So I was actually offered a position back at Vesterheim where I had first started as an intern. In Iowa. In Iowa. They had, the director had called me up and asked if I wanted to come back to work in the development department. Okay. Which was kind of a perfect combination of the business and the history. Yep. Because I loved museums and I could be involved with museums, but I was doing more fundraising and business type work. So I accepted that job to come back to the Midwest. And I was there for just about three years when I decided it was finally time to go home to Marshall and really be more full-time involved with my parents in the business. So where, I mean, when you came back to Marshall, so you had some fundraising experience. Yes. And when you came back, your the fudge was already started in the fundraising? Yep, they had been doing it of. for probably about 10 years already. It started very small with just one priest actually asking if he could sell our products for a, a trip that they were taking in their parish. Sure. And my dad had said, sure, we can try it. Yeah. I know he was worried that people might not come into the store if they were getting their fudge elsewhere, but it had the exact opposite effect. People would get their fudge through the fundraiser and then run out of it so quickly that they had to come back into the store to find it. Oh, that's awesome. So they had been doing fundraising for about 10 years, and it was it was moderate growth consistently for that, that time. Um, but then in 2018 which was when I came back, we were able to implement some new things that kind of just helped build that growth even more um, and really promote the sales to where we are now. And we've seen growth in our fundraising program pretty much year over year mm -hmm. um, as we've gone through the years. And when you came back, so you came back in 2018, and then you connected with Celia? Uh, so I met Celia at the very end of 2019, beginning of 2020. Okay. So she went to school at a uh, town, Tracy, probably 20 miles, 25 miles away. And she was familiar with one of my good friend classmates. Okay. <laughs> um, and so he had called me up one day over Christmas break and just said, Nick, do you want to meet this girl? She's home for Christmas break. She's really great. She's awesome. I think you should get together and you would hit it off. And so we did. And we hit it off. And you hit it off. And here you are. And here we are. And now we're expecting our first child in November. So Congratulations. We're very Thank it's you. so exciting. Yeah. Oh, it's so exciting. See, the, the legacy is going to live on. That's right. <laughs> it's continuing. That's right. We're making a little fudge, a right. little fudge maker. <laughs> How does Celia feel about the family business, too? Because that is a family business. Everybody's kind of involved. Right. And she, she has been involved a little bit, especially in the holiday season when yeah. it gets really busy. She is very kind in coming either after work or taking time off of work to come help us out. Um, and she and I have discussed if she could either come and work at the family business or if we would want to work together. And I think we're both open to it. It doesn't seem like quite the right time at the moment. Sure. But I think she would have interest in doing it. I would have no reason to not want to do that. She's very talented, and I think she would really help the business grow. <laughs> so um, she definitely has interest in it, and she's around often enough that she has a little – Starting she to get an understanding or, yeah. of, of how things are run and how you know what she might want to focus on or what she might want to change or things like that. Sure, sure. Well, even just as a support system, you know, That's like right. when you're a small business owner, there's everybody just knows you gotta. It takes it takes a whole community to it does. make it work. It does. You gotta lean on people when you need to, and it's nice to have those people that can step up. Yeah. So, yep. very cool. Well, so third generation business. Yes. You're back. You're in it. This is a very unique. We don't have a lot of third generation businesses that go through our programs. We definitely see second generations. And I think it's just it's a really cool opportunity to talk about how that what that means, because there is a legacy involved in that. And yeah. I know that like your grandfather and your father, you're very rooted in your family. And like even going in the office, I see, you know, there's pictures of grandpa and the beekeeping and right. there's pictures of Nick on the tractor during the... Right, there's a young me out there <laughs> yeah. with, the, with the beehives and things yeah. like that, yes. So what does that mean? What is third generation legacy? Like, what, is, what does that mean to you? What are... You know, I'll answer that first by starting to say that I need to thank both of my parents because there was never any pressure as a child to grow up in mm. being a third generation to the business. Um, 
for I have three siblings, so there's four of us, and for all four of us, they were very adamant that if you want to do it, that's fine. There's no pressure to do it. And it's really cool. I am the one out of the four that actually has interest in doing it, and so you know it was a little bit of a winding road to get back there. But now that I'm back, you know I just really appreciate that they gave me that flexibility and that space to come to my own decision that this is what I wanted to do. Um, but it does carry, you know, a lot of responsibility. You look back at what your grandpa had done. I look at what my dad had done, and to see the risks that they took and to see the areas that they grew the business in and the changes that they've had to make to keep it relevant for, we're almost at 75 years. Um, it just is a reminder to me every day that I need to not be complacent. I need to just be aware of not only kind of the business uh, environment, but just the environment of the world as a whole to see mm -hmm. what direction things are going in. Right now, top of mind very much is the uh, price of cocoa. I don't know if you followed this at all, but the price of cocoa has either doubled or tripled in about the last six months. And a lot of that is because most of the cocoa comes from Central Africa. Um, some of it comes from South America. And they've had a lot of not only political strife, but uh, environmental issues and kind of some um, diseases that have gone through the trees. And so like, it's really, really affected the cocoa market. Okay. And when you look at our business that yeah. is pretty heavily reliant on that, it just makes you think, how can we keep this sort of alive no matter what might come towards us? Um, and to, that's a hard question. That is a hard question. I mean, to challenge that though, is there also comfort knowing that there's been ups and downs in the past? Yes. And they've made it through and yes. I'm going to make it through this. Too. And I think growing up as well and seeing those times where yeah. there was more success and times where it was more lean just makes you have an understanding of, you know, probably being a little bit more cautious and not overextending yourself at Absolutely. any point. Because if you're going to stick around for the long haul, if times are good, that's great. But just hold on to it because there will be times that come that will be not so great. Um, so I know That's earlier awesome. I had mentioned, you know, probably needing an expansion on the building and yeah. there are things like that that we really have had a lot of serious talk throughs sure. about of, you know, when's the right time to do it? What's the right size to build? You know, how much money can you realistically put into this that won't jeopardize anything long term? And um, there's just a lot of a lot of questions and a lot of thoughts, a lot of conversations that happen. Well, sure. And like those things, I mean, I've been to your location and you utilize every inch of that space. You we have do. coolers and freezers and, yep. and the manufacturing area. I mean, it's very well done. It's very well put together. But I'm sure like even when I was there, like it gets very full. Right. You've got there is a capacity limitation of what you can do. Right. And then even on top of that, you look at I was talking about ordering in bulk. Yeah. You know, some of these ingredients, right. they can be hard to come by, especially starting with COVID, but then even after we still have random ingredients that all of a sudden you can't find or can't get for six months. And if you're able to have the space to be able to buy a little bit more at a time, yeah. that protects you a little bit from when you go out and you're on your last pail or your last box of whatever the ingredient is and they say, oh, well, we don't have any of that. It's going to be four months <sighs> and you can't wait that long. You know, that's just a lot of business headache and hassle when you have to try to work around to figure out where you can find the same product from somebody else or yeah, somewhere else. Absolutely. So in in three generations of a business, 75 years strong, what would you say, what are like the, um, what will, okay, two parts. What are the pillars of the business that you think is carried through from your grandpa? Like what are the things that is still very important, still front and center? And then also, I want to know, what's it like being a part of this legacy? You kind of just touched on it, but, you know, what's it like being a part of the story? You're a part of the story now. Sure. Uh, the first question, one of the, the main pillars that yeah, comes to my mind is just hard work. Hmm. I, my grandpa worked incredibly hard, um, and I don't know anybody who's worked harder than my dad. He just works incredibly hard. And I recall when I was growing up, you know, he would maybe come home for supper and help with some schoolwork, and then he would just go back to work. And it might be a couple hours and something had to get done, so he would just go do it. And so I think that work ethic 
I've seen in my grandpa, I've seen in my dad, and I know that I have it as well, where when it's the busy time and the work just needs to get done, you just have to put in the days mm -hmm. to get it done. Um, so that's the first sort of pillar that kind of comes to mind. Mm -hmm. um, but could you repeat the second part of the question yeah. about the generations? Yeah, I mean, well, I see it now like you've been there for a few years, and in the in the story of the Klein Family Foods and Walnut Grove Mercantile, I mean, it started with Grandpa, and now Nick is woven into the story. Yeah. I mean, you're a part of this journey now. So what's it, what's it like being a part of the legacy? I mean... It's fun. Honestly, it's fun. I know that sounds weird to say, but it's just, it's fun to be able to look at, at different parts of the business, the national championship trophies, the pictures of my dad and grandpa or my grandpa and his brother working. And it just, it makes it fun knowing that you're doing something that has been in your family, that people in the area are familiar with. I know when I was in the business reinvention class, some of the the mentors and helpers were like, oh, I know Klein's honey. Yeah. You know, I've been getting that forever or yep. I've seen that forever. And that's just really rewarding. And then now with the fudge, you know, you see people who come in from, they're driving through Marshall from Winona and mm -hmm. they're like, I recognize this box. And it's like, oh yeah, we probably did a fundraiser in you know, one sure. of your schools or one of your churches over there. And just to know that that many people are having an impact from what you're doing um, is very rewarding. I know the other part um, that I was gonna say is I've seen the add-on that my grandpa and my dad and my mom have made. And so it kind of makes me excited to see what additional part of the business will come from, from my sort of generation. Yeah. And you know I've helped make a lot of improvements with my parents and my parents took a big jump when they added the retail store you know, they added a jump, or they took a jump when they added the flavored honeys back in the early 90s. And so it's kind of time where it's like, well, what is Nick going to bring that's going to change the trajectory or change the, the offerings of the business? And, you know, I, I give it some thought and I want it to be something that comes naturally. But sure. I know that there will be the time where I sort of put my stamp on things um, to kick off sort of how I would view it as the third generation. Which is so exciting. Yeah. A little nerve-wracking, but excited. Okay, so that one, okay, so, well, you just brought me to what I think I'm going to go to the next topic was our reinvention program. Mm -hmm. So in reinvention, we do a final day in person, and we kind of, we combine three sessions into one. But the first session we do when we kick off the day is creative inspiration. Yep. Now, we really went out on a limb. You did. <laughs> For you guys. What was your first impression when you saw the creative inspiration? And I want honest feedback because there was a reason behind it, but I want to hear it. You know, I think I was pretty shocked the first impression. <laughs> um, it wasn't quite what I had expected. Uh, and I think, you know, Betsy had talked about really wanting to push the envelope with yes. it uh, to just get me thinking outside the box and kind of thinking bigger picture, which is great. Um, but it was it was a little bit of a shock to the to the system because I grew up around this. I've seen the same mm -hmm. you know kind of design or the same colors or the same labels, sure. or same branding for so long. To see something pretty <laughs> far out in left field compared to what that was, yes. uh, you know, it was it was pretty uh, pretty speechless for me. I don't think I said a whole lot. <laughs> right, but you just you you said exactly what I was hoping that you would say because. We saw this as a great opportunity, maybe to shock your system a little bit. Yeah. Like, you know, because when you, like you said, you're an owner in training, and, and we thought, you know, wouldn't it be a gift to show Nick something completely outside of his comfort zone to bring him all the way to this end? So if he wants to come back and work somewhere in the middle yeah. ground in the future, that he can. And it was a great reaction. It was kind of like, oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that, that seems familiar. Yeah. <laughs> But so when you think about like, so not, I'm not saying that that's where you're going to go with it, but when you think about like, wow, and maybe it did this, but this in 10 years could look completely different. Like this could right. be same pillars, same legacy, same values, similar products, but it could, I could make this into, you know, my, right. my own thing or for the next part of the legacy. Right. Like, that's a really big thought. 
It is a big thought. And going back to what I said about putting my sort of stamp on the third yeah. generation, I know, you know, when my grandpa started it, there was the Klein label that was the sort of standard that he had created that was used. And then my parents created this new label in the early 90s, and then they added this whole new uh, brand of Wall and Grove Mercantile yeah. in the early 2000s. And so it has been an evolving business. And yep. I think sometimes it's easy to forget that. That you just think, well, it's always been this way. And it's like, well, the business has been around for 73 years and it's changed probably, you know, three, four or five times. And so even though it might seem to be a huge jump or something crazy that doesn't make sense, in 20 years, people could be like, oh, yeah, I recognize that. That's, that that's what it's been for the last 20 years. Right. So, you know, just keeping an open mind to know that anything is possible on that front um, is just a good reminder. I love to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, nobody knows where it's going to go, nobody right? Knows. But That's it's right. fun. Keeping an open mind is super important. When you were talking about the evolutions from grandpa to dad to Nick, I got to know. We heard about the good stuff. It's beautiful. They're hardworking, family's super priority. What's it like having a disagreement in a third generation owned business? You know, it's kind of it's kind of hard. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Let's get gritty, Nick. Yeah. Um I'm very thankful. I was talking about the ways the Lord has blessed me. I am an excellent communicator, and I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I, I'm very good at sort of empathy and communicating with others and trying to work through things. And so when there are disagreements, because they happen fairly frequently, it's just a matter of talking about it, having a conversation, looking at pros and cons, trying to understand why someone is coming at it from the viewpoint that they are, trying to explain your own viewpoint as to why you think something needs to change or not change. Um, and it's hard because it's my parents. And so sometimes yeah. you just have to say, I'm disagreeing with you as a business partner, not as your son. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Where it's like, this has nothing to do with our parent-child relationship, <laughs> even though it feels like it. And I mean, it still sort of does, even though you try to kind of wall that off a little yeah. bit. It's more so I'm looking at this from a business perspective. This does not make sense or this does make sense and we should do it this way. And, you know, eventually you kind of either come to some sort of compromise that both parties are comfortable with um, or it ends up, frankly, sometimes just getting tabled for a while. You know, if you can't seem to come to some sort of agreement or conclusion on something, you just say this isn't going to be the end of the world if we can just hold out for six months or a year to make a decision on it, let's just wait. There's plenty of other things that need our attention and need our work and things right. like that, that we don't have to hammer out everything um, right when it comes up. That's really good advice. A lot of businesses are family owned. It's husbands, it's wives, it's kids, it's parents. It's, I mean, that is great advice. It's hard not to take it personally. Right. Even when it's two business partners, it's hard not to take it personally. Right. And, you know, you you do sometimes take it personally. And you just eventually get over it. There are way more important things in the world than whatever it is that, you know, is either going on in the business or that sure. you would take personally, you know, if someone sure. disagreed or agreed or whatever it is. They're just, to keep your priorities straight, there's a lot more important things in the world than what seems like this monumental decision or disagreement in front of you. Well, that is a great point of view to be able to have. And also, I think that whole communication thing is so key to make sure that you've got everything out on the table, they can put everything out on the table, and we can, once it's out on the table, we can work with it and we can get to a conclusion. But if That's it's right. not, it's really hard to move forward. Right. It's right. really good advice. Yep. And so what a gift. That's what I try. And sometimes it's nice to hear my own advice because <laughs> I don't always follow that. Some days you just don't quite have it. Well, I was just going to say that. But when you're in the moment, it can be really hard. <laughs> it can really be really difficult. hard. But patience helps. Yeah, patience does help. Yeah, I, Well, I can see that you're, like, like you said, that you have empathy, you're a good communicator. But what a gift to be able to bring that like, yeah. into a business. That's yeah. awesome. Um, into any aspect of life, not just That's business. That's right. I use it <laughs> far beyond just the business scope. Right. Yep. So what other advice? If you, if you were talking to somebody else or somebody heard the podcast and they said, oh, my gosh, I'm going into a third generation business or a fourth generation business. Yeah. And if you're going to, if they called you up on the phone and said, Nick, I need some advice. I'm, I'm doing this. What what do you got to tell me? You know, that's that's always a hard one, I think. For me, faith is a big part of my life, so I always pray. I pray a lot. I pray for 
for help or guidance in things. Um, awesome. What I just talked about with patience would be a big one. You know, it seems like everything has to be made immediately and there's such rush decisions and it's the only thing you can focus on or think about, but just be patient, you know, if you feel like the timing or something isn't quite right for something, whether it's to be a part of the business or for someone to step out from the business, you know, just be patient and understanding. Things should work, should work themselves out and just take advantage of the prior generation, in this case, my parents, because they have so much institutional knowledge and it doesn't always directly correlate to where the business is now or where it's going, but you would be amazed at the amount of things that they still recall or know or remember that can really add on to whatever new direction you might be wanting to take the business um, because they've just been in it for so long that they know so much. And, you know, you can you can take it with a, a grain of salt. You don't always have to say, well, if it didn't work 20 years ago, it's not going to work now, you know, but it's just nice to know and to listen to what they have to say because it can be very helpful. I really respect that, that you just said that and that you feel that way because I think sometimes when people step in to a new business and also like you're young, a lot of the younger generation don't always think that there is value in what's happened in the past and to be able to learn from that is, it's incredible. Yeah, and I guess another thing I would say would be you just have to be prepared to put in a lot of hard work, <laughs> a lot of hard work. Even if you think like, I don't think this is going to be that much. I mean, it's going to be more work than you could ever do in a lifetime. And so while you have to put in the hard work, you know, try to find what your, what your limit is, what you're willing to put in and what you want to set aside for other priorities in your life to just try to find some sort of balance. That's something that I struggle with and I'm working towards and it's very difficult because you really can pour everything you have into the business and it still won't be enough. Um, and if that's what you really want, if that's the most important thing to you in your life, like that's great and go for it. But I would also recommend make sure you take time for the other areas of your life that you enjoy, whether it's family, whether it's a hobby, whether it's travel, whatever it is. Because I know one of the things I loved about business reinvention is it sort of helped reignite a little bit of my creativity. Yeah. And it was during the very busy time of work for us. And so mm -hmm. it just felt like this slog where you go to work every day and you've got this checklist of things to do that you know is going to take you 14 hours to get done. And then you have different phone calls and emails that pop up. And there's no time for the creativity or the strategic problem solving that I love to do. Um, and so just to try to find some outlets that help you reignite that like I said, business reinvention was that for me, being able to talk to you know, the 10 other business owners that were here in different areas of business and to hear what struggles they were having, what successes they were mm -hmm. having. And you know, it was fun to be able to try to do some problem solving for somebody else. You oh know? yeah. When somebody else has this issue and you're like, oh, I had that issue a while back, or I know what could be a good solution for you. And then to realize that they can also do the same for you. Well, and it's such a great opportunity because as a small business owner, it's it, it can be very isolating and there's not a lot of people who understand the lifestyle, right. the balance that you need to have and what it's like to own a small business, Yeah, especially in like a rural area. And so I think like those business reinventions, you just said it, to be able to bring business owners together and to speak into each other's businesses, to offer advice, to hear each other to speak something out loud is like it's so impactful right especially for someone who's not in it you know they're on the outside looking in and they say well yeah i can see why that would be a problem or have you ever thought of doing it this way you know just that new set of eyes or if you take a break away from your your day-to-day -day, you can see things in a different way that help you know push through some of those problems that come up and will always be there to just help your business keep growing it's always hardest to see it when you're in it. Yep. It's, it's Especially like, when it's the really like really busy and you yeah. just have no time to to think about anything besides what's right in front of you. Yeah. It's really good advice. The balance thing and small business ownership. I mean, if you can make it a priority and put it in front, but it is really Right. I would say really if you can hard. make it a priority, again, reach out to me and let me know how you've done it. <laughs> it's hard. It's very hard. It's hard, but then, you know, if you're if you have a passion. So like the fundraising part of it 
when we went through reinvention seemed like that was a passion of yours like that it really fit with you and so like if you're passionate about a part of your business or about your business or like even if it is a segment of your business that passion can fuel you to keep doing it and then that kind of helps maybe bring a little bit it doesn't make you resent the time that you're putting into your work because you're passionate about it you're making a difference about it and i with the programs especially like sometimes when people come in like you said you're in that slog and then they kind of start resenting their business Right. It's like, but you got to remember why you're doing it and the impact that you're making. And once people can connect with that, it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm very thankful. We actually have probably a handful of groups every year that end up. Maybe it's a card with all the kids names signed on it or like thank yous or notes like that that really lift you up and keep you going on those tough days where you're like, oh, good. They did appreciate the fact that I made that extra effort that cost me three hours of work, but they were really appreciative. And that's. You know, that's really important. I love the idea of having like a wall somewhere in your store at your location with all the different locations of organizations Mm, that you've mm -hmm. helped or like photos of the different organizations. Like, I mean, thinking for, yeah, your customers to come in and see that impact that you're making, like it would be so huge. Yeah. And then too, even for you, like I can see you unlocking the door and walking in and seeing this wall and being like. Let's make some fudge today. That's right. I, <laughs> I need to go help somebody else in Colorado because we haven't helped enough people there yet. Heck yeah. Well, yeah. It's, it's endless. Yeah, it You're going to keep helping. It I is. mean, you guys yeah. have 100,000 pounds of fudge. That's right. We need a lot of people out there to eat it. Yeah. <laughs> That's so many organizations that you've helped. It and is, it's, yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Yep. It's pretty cool. So let's talk about the future. You know, sure. we've talked about how you got here, what you're doing. Yep. We don't really know what the pivot's going to be, but what do you what do you think? Where do you see it? Well, there's a few things that that kind of concern me for the future. One of them is the cost of shipping yeah. and the unreliability of shipping. Because mm-hmm. um, we make a product. Now, granted, most of it gets sent out in the winter. So if it's frozen, it's not going to matter. It's not going to melt or anything like that. So that's actually very convenient for the business. But, you know, it's really expensive and that can really limit being able to give 50% to groups. And then if the group is far away, like in Georgia, it gets fairly expensive for them to be able to ship it down. Um, And so that's something that kind of concerns me that I want to try to figure out a better way to do it. And I, I don't know yet, but just thinking about different ways of transporting or implementing shipping costs. Um, The other thing that's very important to me is sort of environmentally friendly products. Now, all of our ingredients for our caramels and our fudge are all um, sort of eco-certified by the larger corporations that, Mm -hmm. that we provide or that we get the ingredients from. But looking at adding different products to the fundraising line, because it's always important to add things. You don't want to become stale with the same old flavors that you're always doing. And so implementing maybe a rotating flavor every year, or every other year, um, possibly some different products that might be more um, more encompassing to the people that maybe don't like fudge yeah. or caramels. I know when we added caramels to our fundraising offering, that was has become basically the top seller now because I think there are a lot of people who don't really care for fudge, but well, they love a good caramel. Excellent. They love a good caramel. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, So I think just trying to find different products. I know since we make soap, that could be a potential product that could go into fundraising. Um, I don't know how successful or how much interest there might be in that. But we've done a few little testing testing markets with different fundraising groups where they sell some of our other products just to see, does it work well? Do people have interest? How does it ship? You know, if you start shipping things with glass, like in jars or bottles, then you're even more worried about breakage. So those are kind of a lot of the questions. I I hope, you know, to at least, I was thinking this morning that it would be about 2050 or 2051 that we would hit our 100 years of business. So in about 20, what is that, 26 years, years. 27 years. So I would hope that I will at least be around that long to get us to 100. Of course you will. (laughs) I mean, working, working at the business, you know, to get us at least to 100 years and, and, you know, kind of see what, what the world looks like at that point. It's going to be really interesting. It's going to be fascinating. Oh, I can't wait. We'll come back on a podcast and talk yeah. about oh, it. Yeah, you bet we will. Yeah. Hey, we could do one at like <clears throat> 85, 95, 
in 100. You got it. Okay. All I right. like it. Well, any other, like, big changes to the business or future planning that you're going through right now or that you're trying to set up now for your future self? Right. I mean, part of it, like we talked about a little bit of this expansion. Yeah. Um, New one of the One of the best ways to store our product, our fudge and our caramels, is to freeze it. And so to be able to have a little bit more storage space. Um, I don't know if anybody in the food business might be familiar, but there's a pretty um, severe lack of cold storage mm -hmm. in Minnesota, especially in rural Minnesota, mm -hmm. which is where we are. Um, and so trying to find some ways to have access to more cold storage um, would be beneficial to growing our business and making, making kind of the, the peaks and the valleys a little bit easier as far as our workload because so many people between Thanksgiving and Christmas yeah. or Christmas break need their product that it can be hard to do it all in a short amount of time. That's the most important thing for us. Absolutely. I also, when you were talking about cold storage, like my brain went to you having like storage units in the back, but all cold storage units and different businesses like coming up and pulling stuff up and putting them in. Yeah. Like, hey, look at you got a cold storage unit. Yeah. A little <laughs> bit bigger than that. We're talking <laughs> some bigger walk-in freezers. But yes, that might work too. We'll have uh, you come down and design it for us. Yeah. No, that's a terrible idea. Terrible idea. Um, I would like to know what it's like. You kind of mentioned this in rural Minnesota. There's cold storage. That's what made me go here. But mm -hmm. what is it like being back in? I mean, Marshall's a, a fairly right. Marshall's large Marshall's a pretty large city, city for rural Minnesota. For rural Minnesota. Yep. But still, it is rural Minnesota. And you've been around to different places. And you grew up there. But what's it like being a part of a rural community again? You know, it's it's really great. I have a couple siblings up in the cities, and so I'll go to visit them fairly frequently. And, you know, usually when it's time to head back out of the cities and come back home, I'm just so thankful that I'm leaving a little bit of the the kind of chaos that it seems to be in the Twin Cities. And I like, even though Marshall is bigger, you know, it's 13,000, 14,000, mm -hmm. and um, it's a regional hub, so it, it grows quite a bit during the day. But it's just so nice to have a little bit it feels like life is a little slower and that helps me when I try to find my balance um, in between work and life is I just need a little bit slower pace. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I couldn't really imagine trying to, to have this business in the Twin Cities, which I know would be great because you'd have access to so many more people sure. that could stop by and try your products and so many more opportunities for fundraisers. Um, and things like transportation would probably be easier and shipping costs. But there's something nice about just living and supporting rural communities. My wife, Celia, is from Tracy, which is 25 miles away. And it's probably maybe 1,500 people, um, maybe 2,000. I'm not quite sure what the population is now. But just to know that you are providing some employment for people who live in small towns and also providing a service that they otherwise would have to go a long way for. Yeah. You know, to know that you're creating really delicious fudge and caramels that most people wouldn't expect to find out in rural Minnesota, mm -hmm. you know. Just because we live out there doesn't mean we shouldn't have access to some of these really good things. And, you know, it's nice to do it locally where you're not always ordering things off the Internet to get you things that. like that. So, I love that. Yeah, just because we live out here doesn't mean that we don't. We don't right. get to have access to We should things. get the nice things too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's great. All right, somebody who is looking into owning a business, you kind of gave us this with the with the um, multi-generation thing, but advice for people looking at small business, hard work, absolutely. Hard work. Um, you know, if you have a good idea, which is always hard to know if you have a good idea, but you really, you have to just throw it all in the basket if you're going to go for it um, because you really can't you really can't uh, go halfway on these things you know and it's scary it's really scary but if you believe in yourself and if you think you have a good idea and you want to really make it work just go for it because I had I think I had read some book or read something somewhere that talked about a way to try to get over your worries and your fears because you're going to be very afraid that everything might fail. It's just to look at, just talk out to yourself what's the worst case situation. So you start a business and it fails. I mean, is that so bad in the grand scheme of things? If you have to go bankrupt, is that so bad in the grand scheme of things? Hopefully you have your health, you have family, you still hopefully have a home, 
you know, you have food. If that's if that's the worst thing that could happen, you can survive that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Is there anything else that you want to add into our podcast? I, th- I today? think we probably covered it all. I really appreciate you having okay. me on here, and this was my first podcast. So this was kind of exciting. I've never done this before, so thank you. Well, first of multiple, you're very good at it. Well, I. <laughs> I would like to say I practiced ahead of time, but I really didn't. I kind of just went with the flow. So I think we just launched your podcast career. Well, remember that. I'll that need you as first. my moderator. <laughs> okay. okay, perfect, perfect. Well, we can find your fudge. We can find out more about you online. Sure, you can go to our website walnutgrovemerk. Dot com. So that's Walnut Grove and then M E R C dot com. When you go on there, there's a lot of information about the store, but there is also a large fundraising section. Sure, there's a whole fundraising section. Um, if you wanted more information about it, if you want to sign up for it, if you want to see what groups are selling, because some groups will sell online, mm-hmm. um, there's just a lot of information there. And if you're ever in the Marshall area, you know, we're always we're always welcome. We're open six days a week. We're always closed on Sundays. So. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, definitely worth the stop. And also you have some social media. You're on Facebook. Sure. Yep. You've got things going on there too. Yep. So. Well, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule thank to be here. Thank you very here. much. Yeah, it was great. I yeah. really appreciate it. And congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah.